and Professor Clements with you as we consider Chapter 28 of the OpenStax College Physics textbook dealing with special relativity. And this begins our era of what we might call modern physics in the early 1900s is when uh, this material was developed. So some of our, our considerations here, some questions to answer. Is there some change in the way the universe behaves our observations of it and its actual fact of, of changing. <clears throat> if we have high speed situations, you know, Maxwell had speed of light, 300 million meters per second is a speed of light, three times 10 to the eighth meters per second. Um, well, it is a plane, jet plane, uh, high speed situation. Is that gonna affect the time on your watch or other uh, facts about the universe? Can we change matter into energy? Can we change energy into matter? Can we create material? And a little addition problem here is 200 million meters per second plus 200 million meters per second equal to 300 million meters per second. Now you could try that on your calculator, 200 plus 200. Wow, I don't know. Is it really equal to 400? Let's uh, find out. And not in today's material, but in the future. We live in a big universe. Stars are far apart and special relativity explains to us why uh, it's going to be difficult to explore our galaxy unless we can invent a new branch of physics. Uh, uh, we got limitations. Einstein himself, a picture around 1905 here, born in 1879, so about 26 years old, when he came on the scene in a big way in physics. 1905, he published four papers uh, he explained how light can cause electrons to be ejected from a metal, the photoelectric effect we'll talk about in a future chapter. He received the Nobel Prize for this explanation and a new way of understanding light as a particle and not as a wave, or like a particle, not an actual particle. It has no mass. Um, special relativity was too controversial uh, for him to get the Nobel Prize for it. It had not been validated by experiments enough. So, he got the Nobel Prize in the early 1920s for uh, photoelectric effect. Special relativity tells us how the universe behaves at high speeds. He worked on Brownian motion and uh, came up with proof of atoms, that atoms existed, and you can get some information about their uh, size and mass. And E equals mc squared, one of the most famous physics equations, uh, was uh, explained by Einstein in 1905 little older view here. Uh, I think this is the, from the early 1950s. Um, he, his work was not restricted to relativity. He worked in many areas of physics and made great advances in many areas of physics. So let's talk about simultaneous events. We have a person standing by a railroad track. We have a person riding in a railroad car and this railroad car is moving off to the right from the point of view of observer B. The railroad car is moving off to the right. Observer B is going to receive light at the same time from these two flashes attached to the moving railroad car. <clears throat> light's going to go out. There's the same path length as the lighter lights are uh, switched on right when the person B is in the middle of the railroad car that observer B sees. Will observer A note the light uh, reaching observer A at the same time? This railroad car is moving really fast. And as observer A travels off to the right, you have to imagine a wave of light coming from each emitter. Observer A is moving towards this wave. <clears throat> the light's going to travel a shorter distance from the point of view of observer A. And these events will not be simultaneous from the point of view of observer A. We'll have a uh, recognition of the light on the right side flashing on before light on the left side as we're looking at it. Um, events are not simultaneous for two different observers, observers moving uh, with respect to one another. And we'll be talking about special relativity restricted to what's called an inertial frame of reference. An inertial frame of reference. That means velocity is constant. No acceleration, no moving on a curve. Uh, we have to be moving in a straight line at constant speed 
to be in an inertial frame of reference. Both of these observers are in an inertial frame of reference. So consider a light clock on a uh, fast-moving spacecraft. Our light clock consists of two mirrors and a pulse of light goes back and forth. So tick, tock, tick, tock, tick, tock. What's going to happen as we observe this light clock from the Earth, perhaps, if we have a good telescope? Uh, it's all you know, kind of theoretical here, but uh, what happens actually does occur. So we, the astronaut, would see the light beam go straight up and down, and that's going to take some time to accomplish. The person on the ground is going to see this light beam take a slanted path because the light clock is moving off to the right past the observer. So when the beam leaves the bottom, in order to hit the mirror at the top, the light has to travel on the slanted path and then another slanted path back to the bottom. In special relativity, the speed of light is the same for all observers. The speed of light is the same for this person on the ground as for the astronaut. Well, if the speed of light is the same for all observers, which uh, situation is going to take the longer time? Is it going to take longer for the beam to go up and down, or is it going to take longer for the beam to travel on this slanted path? You should say the slanted path. That's the longer distance. So while the person on the ground, if they're holding an identical light clock, they hear tick, tock, tick, tock, tick, tock. The light clock running from their point of view would go tick, tock, tick, tock. There's a longer distance that takes longer time and you should work through the right triangle of this and calculate how much uh, longer time is required. There's going to be a longer time between events on the uh, clock that's moving. This ends up uh, being summarized by the effect called time dilation. Moving clocks run slow by a factor of gamma. Tick, tock, tick, tock, the slow tick tock in the moving clock, though the second hand does not advance as fast, there's going to be less elapsed time on the moving clock. We can calculate how much less by calculating something called gamma. This is a very useful uh, parameter in special relativity. 1 divided by the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. v is the speed of the moving object. c is the speed of light. Our elapsed time on the moving clock uh, is the elapsed time on a stationary clock that we're holding divided by gamma. Suppose V creates a gamma of 3. Suppose we see 30 minutes elapse on our stationary clock. Gamma is 3. We will observe only 10 minutes elapse on the moving clock. While 30 minutes elapses on our clock, only 10 minutes elapses on the moving clock. This is real. It's been confirmed by experiments. And moving and stationary depends on who the observer is. If we call the astronaut the observer, the astronaut's clock would be stationary, and 30 minutes elapse on the astronaut's clock, the astronaut would only see 10 minutes elapse on the Earth. And it comes up, makes a little paradox that we'll uh, clarify later. Uh, proper time is the clock observed by, it's at rest with respect to the observer. Proper time at rest with respect to the observer. Okay, what's this gamma do mathematically? We'll do some of this, these calculations in class, but as the speed increases, gamma increases. As the speed increases, gamma increases. So think about a muon created in our upper atmosphere as a cosmic ray hits uh, atoms in our upper atmosphere. This subatomic particle, the muon, starts moving. The muon is radioactive. It has a certain half-life. And we can measure that in a laboratory by calculating uh, the distance that from the upper atmosphere to the ground, where the muon is created down to the ground knowing the lifetime of the muon, we can calculate how many muons would reach the ground. And it turns out more reach the ground than are expected. More reach the ground than are expected. Why is this? Well, the observer here watching the muon, the muon's clock runs slow. And consequently, it lasts longer. The muon lasts longer and reaches the ground in greater numbers than uh, what we might expect. Um, 
that's one confirmation of, uh, of special relativity. That the moving clock runs slow. Moving clock runs slow. And it runs slow by the factor of gamma that requires a, a, a calculation. Um, so here's the twin paradox. These two uh, individuals are twins, born at the same time. One chooses to stay on Earth. One signs up for a long space journey at high speeds. They start with their clocks synchronized. Maybe they're both 20 years old when the journey starts. This spacecraft goes a long distance to some planet and then comes back. The observer on the Earth would see the clock and all biological activity, that's time related, run slow. So maybe the person on the spacecraft, from the point of view of the person on the Earth, ages 10 years. I'll just set up a hypothetical example here. 10 years. While the person on the Earth ages, you know, let's say 60 years. So the person, on, they started at age 20 person gets back, the person on the Earth will say the astronaut is 30 years old, 20 years old at the start, 10 years of traveling, 30 years. The person on the Earth, their clock has advanced by 60 years, so 20 to 60, 80 years old for the person on the Earth. What do you think happens if we ask the person on the spacecraft, what's the age situation? Well, it's reversed. The person on the spacecraft sees the Earth move away at high speed and would say the person's clock on the Earth only advances by 10 years. And the person traveling in the spacecraft for 60 years would claim they are 80 years old when we get back to Earth. And the person on the Earth is only 30 years old. Only one can be right. This is the twin paradox. Which is right? The person on the Earth is right. The person in the spacecraft has switched inertial frames. Remember, special relativity requires us to be in an inertial frame of reference. When this spacecraft gets to the planet, it has to slow down. It has to decelerate and then accelerate back to make the trip back to the Earth. So the person on the uh, spacecraft has an illegal calculation. They switched frames of reference. And the twin paradox, and there's another way to answer this question, um, the twin paradox, the twin on the Earth ages more, the astronaut twin will age less. Then length in special relativity. There is a change in the length of objects because of motion. This is a little perspective effect, and it's not special relativity related, but uh, different observers would see different lengths for uh, cars in the distance versus close up or something. Uh, let's talk about special relativity. Moving objects are shorter in the direction of motion, and they're shorter by this factor of gamma. Uh, so it's the same calculation we saw before. The length of the moving object in the direction of motion is equal to the length of an identical stationary object divided by gamma. And we call the length of the stationary object that we might be holding in our hand the proper length. Things that are moving are shorter in the direction of motion. There's no change in the width of the object, but uh, in the direction of motion, the length becomes shorter by this factor of gamma. So again, if gamma is three, if we have an object that's uh, you know 30 feet long, that's at rest beside us, while it's moving, it acts as though it is only 10 feet long. It is only 10 feet long uh, as we observe it. So lengths get shorter for objects that are moving. Um, here's the muon again, and it's a little unfortunate this is a horizontal description. The muons actually are moving vertically, but uh, we'll live with it. So from the point of view of an observer, this muon's traveling between two clouds that are roughly two kilometers apart. Uh, from the point of view of the muon, the cloud here is rushing towards the muon, and the distance between the cloud is only 0.6 kilometers instead of two kilometers. So the muon can last longer. Um, more muons can get to this cloud than what we might expect. The muons are radioactively decaying. They're unstable particles. But because the length is shorter, fewer of them will decay before reaching this cloud. Same thing happens vertically. So the muons are created you know, maybe 20 or maybe 50 kilometers high in the atmosphere and moving down towards the Earth, they're moving at nearly the speed of light. 
and the distance to the Earth from the point of view of the muon is much shorter. Consequently, the muons can make it to the Earth before they radioactively decay. More of them make it to the Earth. So, more on that in the future. So here's the twin paradox explained using this length contraction situation. As the astronaut moves towards the star, what we measure as a length from the Earth is a smaller length from the point of view of the astronaut. It's smaller by the factor of gamma. And consequently, the astronaut can get here and come back with less time elapsed. So length gets shorter. That's another way to explain the uh, twin paradox. And we'll do a calculation in class on this. Um, so special relativity, why 1905? Why did it wait till then? People were doing science in you know, Galileo's time and later, 1600s, 1700s, 1800s. Why did no one notice how clocks run at different speeds or lengths become different due to motion? Well, again, it's this gamma factor that uh, shows us what the change is. So I want you to try on your calculator. Use 100 miles per hour as the speed. You know, that's getting pretty high tech in the 1800s for a train. Uh, didn't quite travel that fast, but uh, let's go ahead and use that number. It's convenient. In doing the calculation, C is in meters per second. You'll need to convert miles per hour to meters per second, and then try doing this calculation. So pause the video, try that calculation. Well, I hope you didn't spend too long of time. I hope you didn't rush out and buy a new calculator because your calculator didn't give you a result. Um, this speed is too slow for a calculator to do the calculation for gamma. Uh, you just get a gamma of 1. Um, but try it again if the speed is 6.7 times 10 to the 7th miles per hour. Again, your first uh, calculation should be to convert this to meters per second. And now you get a significant number for gamma, different than 1. As you take 6.7 times 10 to the 7th, square that, divide by 3 times 10 to the 8th squared, Take that value, subtract from 1, then take a square root, then divide into 1. That's how you find gamma. And now you're getting something different than 1, and we're getting an effect. So speed, high speed is required, and high speed wasn't available till the 1900s in uh, uh, subatomic particle experiments to verify special relativity. All experiments verify special relativity. It's always found to be true. It is an accepted law of how the universe works. So there's some food for thought. Uh, Einstein thought about things moving at high speed. Einstein said, speed of light must be the same for all observers. He did not rely on an experiment for this statement. He came up with it on his own, saying the speed of light must be the same for all observers. This allowed the equations of electricity and magnetism to be well formed for both a stationary person and a person moving. That was Einstein's motivation, uh, Maxwell's equations of electricity and magnetism. And then we have speed of light, the same for all observer, um, as our, our fundamental postulate. And another postulate is you can't do an experiment that tells you if you're moving or not. This postulate was accepted by Galileo, Newton, all other scientists before Einstein. So the change with special relativity is that uh, Einstein said the speed of light is a fixed number for all observers. Then we get consequences, time dilation, moving clocks run slow, moving lengths are shorter. And we'll see some other consequences in our next video. Keep reading, ask your instructor some questions.